Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Miha Walsh, and I'm the Executive Director of the Asian Cultural Council. <clears throat> it is an honor to welcome you all here tonight. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and extend our deepest gratitude to Tsuniko and Shoji Sadao, whose generous endowment gift to the Asian Cultural Council has made tonight's event possible. I want to begin by telling a story about John D. Rockefeller III, the founder of both the Asian Cultural Council and the International House here. JDR III first visited Japan in 1929 having just graduated from Princeton University. The trip was designed to help the, the then 23-year-old John take a journey of self-discovery through the experience of firsthand observation of a world totally different from the one he knew. As many of you know, he would return to Japan in 1951 to work with John Foster Dulles on the peace treaty that would pave the way forward for a post-war post-occupation Japan. As he writes in his journals, he looked forward to being back in Japan, working on such an important and significant mission, and above all, reconnecting with his Japanese friends and rediscovering more about a culture that he had gro grown to love so much. Days after his arrival, he had settled in his room at the Imperial Hotel, the Teikoku Hotel in Tokyo, where many of the Allied forces under M General MacArthur had been staying. He was surprised to learn that under the rules of the occupation, Japanese nationals would not be allowed to be, uh, to be in the hotel above the mezzanine floor. JDR III was dismayed and embarrassed by this. He wanted to be able to host his Japanese friends and talk over tea in his suite, showing his guests the same kind of hospitality and kindness that he was often comforted by on his prior trips to Japan. When he was told there were no exceptions to the rule, JDR III came up with one idea. He asked for part of the mezzanine floor to be squared off and to be made into a suite so that he could invite his Japanese friends and graciously, as graciously as possible host them in a quiet, private setting. This small but significant gesture was reflective of John D. Rockefeller III's humble and quiet way of showing kindness and care. He often remarked on how he was struck by the kindness and care that he was shown in Japan and how he shared those values with the Japanese people deeply. So I cannot imagine a more fitting venue for our East-West dialogues. As you all know, International House is our sort of older sister organization and we are very grateful for their support of tonight's event. Founded, in, founded by John D. Rockefeller III in 1955, eight years before the Asian Cultural Council was established, we share very similar values and missions. The cultural that cultural exchange is one of the most effective forms of creating understanding and respect in the world. The Asian Cultural Council was founded in 1963 with the belief that the fostering of cultural relations could be a form of insurance for this dangerous but exciting world. We exist and we continue to work with the conviction that through an investment in creative individuals, we can build meaningful cross-cultural connections and long-lasting relationships across borders and divides. Since its founding, ACC has supported nearly 6,000 exchanges in more than 25 countries by awarding grants to artists and cultural specialists in over 20 different disciplines. To travel and live in another country, to experience self-discovery, much like JDR III did on that trip in 1929, almost 90 years ago. At ACC, we believe that artists and cultural scholars are uniquely positioned to connect and share. We know that this kind of exchange enables continued dialogue, creates empathy, cultivates respect, which is so essential to building a more harmonious and peaceful world. Today, the importance of creating meaningful connection, understanding, and respect is critical if we are going to hope to work together. And tonight, it is with this con commitment to the values of cultural exchange and securing a better world in the future that I am particularly delighted to welcome you to our East-West Dialogues. 
So with that, I'd like to introduce tonight's speakers. <clears throat> Fumihiko Maki is the principal of Maki & Associates, the world-renowned architectural firm he founded in Tokyo in 1965. Notable projects in Japan of Mr. Maki's are Hillside Terrace, Spiral, Makuhari Messe, the National Museum of Modern Art in Kyoto, and the Japanese Sword Museum, which just opened earlier this year and which my son is so excited to visit. <laughs> His international projects include Four World Trade Center, MIT Media Lab, Media Core in Singapore, SeaWorld Culture and Art Center in Shenzhen, the Bihar Museum in Patna, and the Aga Khan Center in London, which also just opened in 2018. He's a, an acclaimed writer and has been awarded many prestigious prizes, including the Pritzker Prize, the Premium Imperial, and the AIA Gold Medal. And notably, my favorite uh, distinctions of his is the ACC Project Participant Grant that he took part in in 1976. Um, we are delighted to have Mr. Maki in conversation with Peter Grilly tonight. Peter Grilly was born in New York and raised in Tokyo from 1947 to 1959. He was an editor at Weatherhill Publishing Company and served as, as director of Japan Society in New York. After working in broadcasting and consulting, he led the Donald Keene Center of Japanese Culture at Columbia University. Peter is President Emeritus of Japan Society of Boston. In addition to all these leadership roles, he is also an award-winning filmmaker and writer. In 2003, Peter was recognized with the third class order of the sacred treasure from the Japanese government in recognition of the activities and cultural exchange between Japan and the United States that he has done. At ACC, we often invoke the philosophy of our founder who believed that the individual has the power to change the world. Both Mr. Maki and Mr. Grilly no doubt have changed this world. And in addition to doing that, or in, 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 bringing, uh, in changing the world, they have always brought people together. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Maki and Mr. Grilly to the stage. Thank you. We thought before our dialogue, before our conversation starts, um, Miho and her colleagues at Asian Cultural Council asked if we could do a short visual presentation from each one of us, and that's what they're uh, about, to, about to start. Here's Mr. Maki. Do I start? Because I thought uh, Mr. Greeley is uh, going to is uh, Is it reversed or what? Yeah, right, okay. That picture of you as a young man is young much man. better looking than anything in my <laughs> visual no, uh, that was when I was 28. Oh. And, uh, but I will talk about the uh, Washington New Days later. Oh, okay. okay here we go. Um, rather than show you a lot of pictures of my childhood, cute little Peter in Tokyo and things like that, I thought, um, I would show you very short clips from several of the films that I've made, documentary films about Japan. So the next, next slide, please. This is a list of six films that I've made, and I'll just show you a little bit of uh, parts of almost all of them. Next. Uh, the very first film is, that I made in Japan, and I learned a great deal not only about Japan, but about filmmaking, uh, was called Shinto, Nature, Gods, and Man in Japan. And it and many, many interesting features to it. It was the first time that anyone filmed Ise Shrine from the, from the sky. Uh, and uh, as you can see, it was the best way to show the two shrines and the rebuilding. Um, uh, this is a, a picture of Nachi Waterfall. It was also very much part of the uh, the film. Next, next slide, please. 
Um, and the reason for the film was that it provided a kind of cultural context to an exhibition of Shinto art that was being exhibited in New York at Japan Society in New York and really needed to, we felt we needed to give the audience some background on what Shinto was about. Next. The notion of sacred space was deeply ingrained in the religious attitudes of the Japanese people long before shrine buildings came to be erected as temporary shelters for a deity. As in many other religious cultures, the need was felt to reserve and set apart certain holy sites as different in quality from their profane surroundings. Only specially purified priests might enter the consecrated enclosure. Representing an entire community of worshippers, they served as intermediaries between the spirit world and that of humans, transmitting the prayers of the community and the oracles of the kami. <laughs> The presentation of food has always been an important ritual act in Shinto ceremonies. For in symbolically sharing a meal with the kami, priests and parishioners alike join in a moment of temporary union with the deity. Um, each one of the films that I've made um, was sort of a turning point in my work and in my life and my career. Each one opened a door to a whole new area of Japanese uh, experience. Um, one of the somewhat later films uh, was a portrait of Toru Takemitsu, the composer, the great composer, who was probably of my many, 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 many friends in Japan over the course of my long life here, was probably my closest friend of all. Really, really, I wish he were here with us tonight. And a remarkable person, an extraordinary mind, as well as being a great composer. Well, this film was a portrait of Takemitsu as a composer for films. I have known uh, Takamitsu, and uh, he asked me to design about the uh, summer house. Much younger, but oh. then I he was gave the single a job one who was dedicated. Uh, he was the people. single one who was always left behind at the piano, you know, noodling around and trying different things. And he was always the one when we looked at new films or something. He always had to do sort of good, good ideas. I mean, he was always on. But on the other hand, he's so non-pushy that uh, I never thought that he would be, you know. The, one of the finest composers of not only film music, but of music in the late 20th century. November Steps was really a radical departure in the world of classical music. It's the first time that traditional instruments uh, Biwa and Shakuhachi were combined with a Western Symphony Orchestra. Young Seiji Ozawa, whom we all know. The war was a very difficult time. 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 アメリカの昔の映画のこと、やっぱりもしかしたら戦争は負けもう負けるに違いないと思ってたり、日本がやってることは全然おかしいと思ってる人もいるわけだし、でそんなにみんながさ、はあ、鬼畜べえなんかアメリカ鬼だなんとかだとか言ったそんなことももちろんは片,片っぽではあるけど、片っぽではさ、アメリカ素晴らしいと思ってるわけで。
ビンジクの日は飛行機が飛んでくれうわあきれいすげえ飛行機だと思って見てたんだから子供たちは。8月6日は朝から暑い日だった私は工場へ出勤するためいつもの通り壁線の横川駅へ急いだ戦争が終わる頃は中学生っていうのかなそれで兵隊と一緒に働いてましたから山の中でその食料基地っていうかベースベースを作るそのいろんな仕事してたで歌う歌音楽って言えば軍歌ビッアーミーミリタリストの音楽とかそういうのばっかりとかやっぱり音楽が少なかったんですよこれはないある時その内緒で学生から兵隊になってきてた人が内緒で僕らにそのシャンソンを聴かせてくれてフレンチシャンソン。おお大変感,感激したそれを聞いてそれで僕はもし戦争終わればなんとか音楽やりたいと。That short moment of just a moment of a French chanson to a young Japanese boy in a work camp, totally deprived of music, starved for music,、uh, to me is just an extraordinary example of the importance of cultural exchange because it changed his life and it changed all of our lives because we've gotten to come to know Takemitsu's music. It has done such an enormous contribution to the world of international culture. Coming from that one moment.、Uh, this was a film that I made、uh, for the Smithsonian on Japanese gardens, and uh, uh, I asked Takemitsu to do the music for it, and I think we can, sh we can show the little clip of the film. <coughs> Rough standing stones, a stream meandering, delight without end, wrote the 14th century priest and garden designer Usop Soseki. How lovely, the setting for elegant play and serene pleasure. For more than a thousand years, the Japanese garden has been a haven of tranquility and a preserve of natural beauty. A vehicle for contemplating life and a wellspring of artistic inspiration. The garden today remains a place apart, serene, symbolic, and sensual. So, this is the 
A place like this is a device that takes you from the world you're actually living in and removes you. It was designed to create a mood, to bring one into a state of poetic creativity. More than being an influence on my work, gardens give me energy. They provide a kind of self-affirmation. And what I like most about gardens is that they don't exclude people, just as music must not exclude people. One should just sit quietly and look at a garden. What you see depends on what you bring to it. This is a portrait of the young, very famous now, blind uh, pianist who won the Van Cliburn competition uh, about uh, five or six years ago. When Nobuyuki was invited to play at the famous proms in London, the British audience discovered what we in Japan already knew. That as great as Nobuyuki's talent is, it was against all the odds that he would rise to such stardom, acclaim and popularity. Because here I feel God has taken his eyes, but God has given a, a physical endowment, a mental endowment to encompass the greatest works of the piano. And at the same time, being able to come out and play a Chopin concerto with that sweetness and gentleness and yet with a sincerity that is deeply touching. I had to keep from crying when I left the room. And the winner is Nobuyuki Suji. This is the most recent film that I worked on uh, just two years ago, um, th uh, two years ago, about Hiroshima and the extraordinary man in Hiroshima, Mr. Shigeaki Mori, who was working on behalf of preserving the memory of Americans killed by our bomb in Hiroshima. Just an excerpt from the film. The bell rang and my mother looked and said, oh my God. And she picked up the telegram and she read it and said, it's, he's missing. We regret to inform you that your son Norman Roland Brissett is missing in action. I didn't know what happened to the war. 
We can tell our children a different story, one that describes a common humanity. Ordinary people understand this, I think. Like the man who sought out families of Americans killed here because he believed their loss was equal to his own. The city was destroyed. And somehow, he transitioned that into helping us. We could still be sitting in the United States wondering what happened to our loved ones and knowing that we have not known the truth. Him being so far away, and they don't know where he was. And I do. Just before I get off the ship, they kept telling me, Eddie, keep in touch with the families. And those are the last, last words that, uh, and messages I ever get from them.全部で、ご一緒。探しました。そして、そしてね、エブリウェア、フィフティスティーツ。So, I don't, thank you, thank you. I, I don't mean for a moment to take credit for all of these films. Um, as I'm sure you all know, every film is the result of collaboration of a great number of talented, creative people. And for me, it was, I think it was an honor to be associated with these films, but they were really made by many, many other uh, people much more creative than I. But it gives you a, just a quick overview of some of the different uh, chapters in my life and work. So now, Maki-san, it's your turn. Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, please don't show in, uh, this image. Uh, first, I'd like to just talk. Uh, the, my presentation would not be uh, chronological. I wanted to show you something very important in my life. And uh, uh, I went to teach at Washington University in 1956. I was 28 years old. So when I met my students, some of them are older than me because uh, the came to uh, study under GI Bill. And even some of them have been in Japan at one of occupational. Huh? But uh, when I met those people, the just teacher and the student, it's nothing to do with my age or my race. I've never had unpleasant moment while I was at Washington U for five years. People are very generous and kind. And so uh, I had uh, many lifelong friends during my stay. And now you can go into. And also, besides teaching, I was uh, working at the uh, uh, planning office. And one day, he asked me, because some lady might be giving a fund to school, why don't you just to make sketches. So the lady was Mrs. Steinberg. And I was giving my uh, presentation to them. And uh, she said, 
she liked my uh, project and she would give money if this design is going to be uh, realized. I was nobody. I was just not a registered architect. I have done any thing like uh, galleries, library, and nothing. But she insisted that. So <laughs> I received a commission. The wonderful thing was that all my colleagues didn't have no envy, no jealousy. They just supported me to make this realize. The dean of uh, uh, Washington U was a structural engineer. So uh, he gave the advice on the uh, structures and so on. So everyone supported. I've never forget this generosity and the kindness in my life. So uh, I uh, would like to just go into our next images. And that is their building completed 1962. Next one, please. Ah, I tell you uh, something very uh, interesting. I left Japan after my Tokyo U study, uh, the United States, and I took the cargo boat from Nagasaki to uh, Seattle, Washington, and two weeks voyage. But there are four young Japanese person like myself, and we ate always together with the captain. That is the cargo ship systems. And then we said goodbye after two weeks. Then, 20, 40 years later, I received a call from Fukuoka University, the president, asking me to uh, design the uh, students' union. And he said, you may not remember me, but we are on the same boat <laughs> from Nagasaki to Seattle. Then, next one. Twelve years later, I did media lab at MIT. And next one. There is a, a kind of a party. And one of the uh, middle-aged Japanese lady came to see me because she happened to be a wife of one of uh, directors, research directors in the MIT, uh, American. But she said in the Japanese, my father was with you in a cargo board. Nagasaki <laughs> 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 uh, to uh, Seattle. And uh, I also had uh, one uh, engineer who, so now you could imagine four young professionals, architect, engineers, and also mathematician, uh, that happened to be his father, and also medical doctor who happened to be one of our clients. <laughs> so all going to United States aspire to learn something. That was the 1950s. And two remained in the United States. Two came back. But you could imagine the time, 1950s, <coughs> together with my wonderful experiences in Washington. Next one. So uh, this is the one before we built this particular complex, Hillside West in Tokyo. And we decided to connect the lower street with the upper street because now they are able to 
have a connection. The brown part in the passage, it's open from uh, 7 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock in the evening. And on both sides, people are working or are living. And had this happened in the uh, United States, they said no, because uh, strangers may come up to uh, our present. No, in Tokyo, there are no such thing. This so now this passage are uh, being used by everybody from 7 to 10 o'clock in the evening. 20 years ago, this ha nothing happened since then. There's no complaints, nothing. So to that extent, perhaps Tokyo is still a safe place. And also, there's a small court I made, next one. And there, sometime wedding, sort of a bride and bride, and taking pictures because underneath there's a restaurant to serve for uh, the uh, uh, wedding reception. And next, and sometimes <laughs> lady is sleeping on board. Uh, this could not happen on uh, open court facing to a big street, but once in the inner court, people began to use the place as they like. Uh, since she was sleeping, I didn't get uh, permission to take a picture. <laughs> Next one, please. Next one. Uh, I did a, a large uh, university complex in uh, Tokyo uh, a couple of years ago. And it is the uh, no gate and no wall. And people were able to trespass the uh, campus, at least ground and second floor, freely. And next one, please. Here, uh, we created a rogier. Uh, this is a very uh, common in uh, Italy, like a city room. Next one, please. So the one on the left is uh, in Italy in Bologna or some place, but in our place, just the uh, wives of neighbors come and can chat. And sometimes students can play uh, music. And it could be used just one of the city rules. Next one, please. But also, nearby, the uh, nursery school teacher come bring the uh, children together. You can imagine the university campus could be used for children. And it animates the next one, please. And you see, kids love a yeah, big space, like American. And uh, uh, it's not really big in the uh, uh, US, but you could see the uh, children hugging the uh, round columns, like they might imagine they're hugging mothers who are being hugged. So uh, I always recommend if young architects design nursery or kindergarten, they should make the round columns, not square columns. <laughs> Next one, please. Uh, now I go into uh, one of uh, uh, projects I have designed in uh, uh, New York, United States, in the 19, uh, 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 Richard Rogers, Norman Foster, and Daniel Lipskin. He was a master architect of this area. And uh, Pataki, governor of New York at that time. And Silverstein, our client, and myself. In, that was 2005. And uh, finally, we have revealed our design 
around uh, uh, Memorial Park in uh, New York. Next one, please. So uh, you, you could see the, uh, our building number four is sitting at corners, facing to uh, the uh, Memorial Park. Next one, please. Next one. Oh yes, it's uh, like a, a piece of uh, glass sculpture. Next one, please. And our building faces directly to the Memorial Park. And from now, uh, we go into a film. The NHK, National Broadcasting Company, made, oh, <laughs> yes. I have received so many images from unknown people. And uh, so, uh, too, I received shows, the, uh, our building and number one. But sometimes uh, our building disappears in uh, particular light reflections. And I thought this might be a proper image to uh, people who perished there. But from now on, uh, I like to go into the film. Hi, my name is Yusuke Kushima. I'm a Japanese architect. I'll be hosting this program. Today, I'm in New York. It's September 11th a very special day. As we all know, 13 years ago, a terrible tragedy has happened. I myself remember when I used to live in the States, there was a twin tower, a very symbolic building right behind us, and now it's gone. On September 11th, 2001, terrorists launched multiple attacks against the United States, bringing down the iconic World Trade Center towers in New York and killing roughly 3,000 people. Where the Twin Towers once stood, there is now a memorial dedicated to the victims, featuring giant reflecting pools in the footprints of the towers. Around the pools are slabs of black granite with bronze plaques on which the names of all the victims are inscribed. In the 13 years since the horror of 9-11, an endless stream of visitors has brought their flowers and prayers to this site. Next to the memorial, there are newly built skyscrapers. And one of the skyscraper is designed by a Japanese architect. He's a very important Japanese architect who created the modernism and the contemporary architecture today, Fumihiko Maki. Fumihiko Maki is one of Japan's most renowned architects. He designed the new Four World Trade Center building. Two years after 9-11, redevelopment plans for the World Trade Center were announced. Four skyscrapers to be designed by world-famous architects. In November 2013, Maki's building was the first of the four to be completed. Two, three, all right. In September 2014, Maki came to New York and paid a visit to the building he designed. How do you know I am Maki? I know because I looked at the plans and I met you when the hotel opened up in November 2013. I don't know if you remember. Oh, I see. You have a good memory. Ah, a good memory. Thank you. Beautiful tower. Beautiful. Thank you.
Tower World Trade Center rises 977 feet, about 300 meters. It has 72 above ground and four below ground floors. The dominant feature of the building is its glass facade. A special process was used to make the glass reflect light, like stainless steel or aluminum, creating a mirror of the sky and nearby buildings. Four World Trade Center often melts away into its surroundings. Maki created a building that is unobtrusive and elegant. The lobby of the building is an airy open space with 13 meter ceilings. floor-to-ceiling windows make the adjoining Memorial Plaza clearly visible from the lobby. And opposite the windows is a black wall that extends to the ceiling. The water, trees, and sky, key elements of the Memorial Plaza, can also be felt inside the building. Moreover, on the back wall of each of the three elevator halls, video of flowing water, green trees, and blue sky runs on a loop. Before 9-11, Maki had visited New York countless times and seen the Twin Towers, of course. Here is a photograph he took in 1993 of the towers reflecting the sunset. September 11th, 2014. Huge crowds fill the Memorial Plaza. Standing beside the vast reflecting pools, which testify to the twin towers that once soared here, visitors contemplate the tragic events of 9-11. What do the visitors think of Maki's four World Trade Center building? I think it's great. I think they did an excellent job, you know. It was pretty, pretty tall and nice. I haven't been inside yet, but I'm hoping to. Uh, I think also it's, it's a wonderful piece of architecture. Um, it reflects the beauty of the city, the beauty of the souls that are unfortunately expired here in this area. And we love coming here. It, it brings such a warm feeling, much emotion. Maki's tower reflects something more as well, the thoughts of those who come to the memorial. So this was my small contribution to the New York and the United States. Now, I'd like to show you uh, these uh, images. Uh, I was uh, visiting uh, Madrid to see my friend, and he took me to uh, Piazza San Diego, the uh, central park in uh, Madrid, and many people are sitting intently looking at 
small screen attached on the surface elevation of the uh, uh, opera house. And I asked my friend, what is it? He said, now Verdi's thing happening in opera house, sung by Domingo. I w just wonder what? Is it free to look at? And then suddenly I remember the Japanese word, musho nai. It is, next one please, called unconditional love. I understand this unconditional love appears in the Bible, but uh, I began to thought, to, to think, the cultural activities must be basically based on the uh, unconditional love. Uh, as an architect, I always receive the conditional love of clients. But we try to make <laughs> unconditional as much as possible. This seems to be an obligation of not only architects, but also filmmakers, artists, and anybody. So <laughs> I uh, also said conditional love. Uh, uh, Mr. Gree and I decided not to talk about the uh, Trump <laughs> in uh, this thing. But to me, he advocates conditional love. Too. So uh, uh, I hope you agree on that. And I definitely <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's my end of uh, presentation. Yes. Sure. And uh, uh, one more. Uh, I did a spiral. And always somebody on the esplanade leading us from ground floor or third floor would put the uh, black chairs. And there are somebody looking over the boulevard, street, or reading books. This has never been changed in the last 30 years. Next one, please. But also, there is a cafe in uh, uh, Hillside Terrace I designed. Uh, it's not really too far from my office, so I sometimes come to lunch, and I notice this person is always ordering a bottle of red wine. And after he finished the half, then he picks up sandwich and then coffee. And he's always sitting on the same place. And uh, uh, I ask attendant who he is, and attendant said he's a, a priest from nearby church. And I remember a famous word by a German philosopher Nietzsche, the uh, solitude in the public space is my home. So uh, I believe besides solitude, he was doing small rituals by himself, enjoy the moment. So uh, since I was uh, uh, writing a short article on solitude, I asked to have his permission to have this picture and also the uh, small thing. And I gave him my text. He was very delighted. Then uh, later, I haven't seen him, and I asked attendant, and he said he recently passed away. But these things 
Tell me. Next one, please. Importance of public space. This is the Chaba, famous boulevard in Isfahan. It's a hundred meter wide street, but things are different is at the center. They have a raised small platform for a people to come enjoy with himself. This is probably the best boulevard I have ever seen in my life. And whenever I had a chance to go Isfahan, always I walk this boulevard. Had I been to a young the Iranian just getting married, I think I might have had small musical procession mm -hmm. of a wedding for me at the center of this world. You feel you are, because since it is slightly raised, you feel you are king by alone. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> one more picture is a uh, Panathinaikos in uh, Athens, Greece. And you could see the uh, plaza and also well stadium, you know, welcoming sort of gesture. You are also able to see inside unconditional love. And so uh, uh, I always felt these two pictures I took uh, 19. Uh, Maki san, could you speak? Oh, 60. <laughs> Still, some of the best the, uh, sceneries in urban life I have ever seen. And then, how? you could design such a thing many centuries ago. And it could be this uh, kind of a human wisdom, modern knowledge. Uh, today, uh, when we design the buildings, we have a 3D form and all the AI, and etc. But I think the wisdom of the human being perhaps surpass the uh, knowledge. Because they are not affected by uh, industrial revolution, but I don't want to go too much because beyond my. So uh, I like to just go back to a uh, conversation with Mr. Green. And I, I uh, before we get into our conversation, our give and take, I would just like the audience to think about, in the context of unconditional love that Makisan has been talking about, think about the modesty of this man that I admire tremendously, the modesty of an architect, and also the essential greatness of an architect who has the courage to design a building 60 stories high that will disappear. An architect who makes his building disappear into nature. I don't know any other architect that combines such modesty, but also such real real greatness. So thank you thank very you. much for that. Uh, Mr. Greeley, and I have decided to uh, talk now about our younger days. And uh, one of them was uh, experiences on the smell. Mm. Should I start with what you want? Sure. Well, well, no, well, you, you mentioned earlier in your yeah. talk about you see, going to uh, America the uh, first uh, time. Uh, yeah. So wh uh, what did you s smell? What was the first yeah. smell that you uh, remember? When I arrived in uh, Seattle, Washington, I stepped up to the city, and suddenly I uh, smell of the metal and the gas. Uh, uh, 1960, maybe we didn't have uh, too much the uh, automobiles in the city. But uh, Mr. Greeley had uh, different experiences because he came to Japan two years after the war. 
Yeah, Maki-san asked me if I remembered what, what smells did I remember from my childhood. Um, I was five years old when I came in 1947, and that set me back. Nobody had ever asked me what smells did I remember, but what an intriguing subject. Um, so after a moment's thought, um, one smell which may not be so pleasant for you to remember, because those were very terrible times in Japan in 1947, was the smell of ashes. Everywhere I went in Tokyo, most of the city was still burned down, there was rubble. Um, so the smell of ashes, I'll never forget in the back of my memory. Uh, ashes of a city destroyed, um, but also many people in those days were cooking, housewives were cooking dinner on the street in um, uh, a very small sort of uh, hibachi, I guess you would call it, a kondo, a ceramic uh, kind of hibachi where the dinner for the whole family was being cooked. So the smell of the charcoal burning is very strong yeah. in my mind. Yeah. And, and then one of the first places where well, when I, when I arrived, my father was working with the occupation government, General MacArthur's government, and I arrived in 1947 with my mother and younger sister, and there was no place yet for so-called dependent families to live in Tokyo. It was before they built Washington Heights and Grand Heights and all those big housing developments. Um, so they sent us um, to Unzen. Unzen in Nagasaki Prefecture. Unzen is an extraordinary, it was a luxury to be sent to Unzen because it was an extraordinary hot spring resort. Um, it had been developed by the British in the 1870s or so, so there was a beautiful golf course and beautiful old British style hotel. But what I remember most was going into the hot springs in Unzen, the smell of sulfur, <laughs> the sulfur smell, yo, the sulfur. Uh, smell is one that I, I will never forget. And then flash forward about 50 years, the first book about Japan that I wrote was a book about the Japanese bath, the sort of cultural history of the bath and of hot springs. So that sulfur smell is still deep in my mind, changed my life. So uh, uh, after I had a strong impression of smell on the metal and uh, gas. Friend of mine took me to uh, horse racing. Then I had a smell of the uh, hamaki cigar. I don't know. Uh, today, American smoke cigars, but not. Uh, they do, especially at horse races. Oh, and I see. And at very fancy bars, too, they smoke cigars. <laughs> I see. But when I was a child, 1930s, whenever I go to my relative's house or ch uh, friend's houses, the smell of wood gives a special identity of the uh, place because both of the houses are made by wood and they use uh, different woods and different woods also give a different smell. So it's the smell was the uh, identity of house. Not anymore. Now today, well, our children lost many things. Huh? They're deprived of these wonderful smells, <laughs> aren't they? <laughs> but you also mentioned about tactility. Yeah, um, uh, sort of a, along with smells, um, the sensation of touch, I think, is very, very important. And we're, t we're talking sort of in Proustian terms, like the great novel of Proust, where the hero takes a sip of tea in his particular cookie that he hasn't tasted from since childhood, and suddenly the taste brings back an enormous outpouring of memory. So we're sort of heading in that kind of direction. Um, Maki-san asked me about the sensation of touch, of, of t tactile qualities, which reminded me that after we came back from Unzen, we lived in an extraordinary building right next to Nihonbashi, right in the middle of Tokyo. It was the headquarters of Nomura Securities, and the building is still there. Um, 
but it had been taken over by the occupation government, made into apartments for, for dependent families. And we lived on the sixth floor. Now, first of all, if you remember Nihon, if you know Nihonbashi, from our window on the sixth floor then in 1940s, you could see Mount Fuji. You could almost reach out and touch Mount Fuji. Now, of course, it's impossible to see anything except the next skyscraper. But a couple of years ago, I was invited by friends at Nomura back to that building because they knew I had lived there as a child. And they said, really, why don't you come and see the building? So I went. And everything was changed. Everything had been totally renovated. Um, the executives of Nomura were all wearing 14-piece suits and very well dressed and they didn't know anything about the building itself. So they called in the superintendent of the building who was wearing very rough clothes and no necktie. He knew everything about this building and he took me through all kinds of back corridors and up and down and it had all changed except Going through a basement corridor, my hand just rubbed against the wall, which was sort of a black marble wall. And suddenly, just like in Proust's novel, touching that black marble wall, I remembered that it was exactly the same black marble from my childhood. And that just opened up a lot of memories again. Tactility is a very, very important. Yeah, in, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. In All these sensations. Sure. Yeah. In a way, Maki-san mentioned his first trip to America on a cargo ship. In a way, we share some of that experience because I grew up in Tokyo, yeah. and my first trip back to America was to go to college at Harvard. Sure. And I went on a cargo ship because yeah. we didn't have any money. Every penny had been given to Harvard University for tuition. <laughs> um, so traveling by cargo ship was the cheapest way to go, yeah. right? True. Only 12 passengers yes. or 10 yes. passengers. That's right. And I arrived in New York, or Hoboken, and then took the train from New York to Boston, which to all the Americans in the audience, you know that's the most crowded corridor in America. It's just packed, it's full. Um, but I looked out the window of the train and I thought America was so huge. There was all this open space between buildings. Yes. It was amazing. Yes. You see, in uh, <laughs> Tokyo, we so accustomed to uh, houses or buildings without too much the uh, residual process. But in the United States, like that. Even in the most crowded part of America, yeah. there's so much open space. Sure. So I was yeah. impressed I had by space. Uh, how, did, how did you feel about space I, I, I had the same impression so when I moved into uh, many places in uh, the United States. Uh, also, yeah. Driving was easier than mm, uh, mm, Japan, mm. And, uh, but uh, we perhaps talk about community. Does community exist today in the large cities like uh, Boston, New York, Tokyo, or Osaka? And you mentioned a very interesting sort of way uh, the. Uh, spontaneous community that being made. Sorry, well, the community. Yeah. Uh, yes, because uh, you uh, once mentioned uh, uh, by efforts of individuals. That are to, some uh, I think what mark -san is referring to is that he appreciates the community that he finds around the world. I'm a little bit dubious of yes, that. Sure. I, I feel that sort of community cohesion is kind of disappearing. Sure. So what I was talking about was the very sort of self-conscious, very conscious attempts to recreate community. Like you look at great performing arts plazas in many places in the world. Uh, designed to create community, sort of designed plazas, not natural plazas, but designed plazas, which to me always seems a little bit artificial in the modern world. And I was wondering, what, what, do, you, what do you think? Yes, I completely <laughs> agree with you. Today, the communities are disappearing, like uh, big bookstores. And uh, uh, since the people became so mobile, there is no generations, same family, doing the same thing, 
and community sort of uh, existed, but not today. And uh, so just as you said, there must be some effort to be made, even for uh, temporary the, uh, uh, community. But I know one exception. In, you know Karuizawa, uh, that uh, big landowners happen to be uh, just off the uh, central Karuizawa. It goes back to uh, almost 100 years ago. Uh, he was the uh, professor at Waseda University. And then he met his friend in abroad, also professor in uh, law. So two of them thought perhaps new community or new development should have no gate, no wall. So everybody can get into uh, entrance. But also they thought it is important to have small or maybe a medium-sized open space because the scholars in the morning, they didn't want to be disturbed by children. So children should be uh, in the open space, Harappa, to have uh, their own study in the small shop. So this Harappa became very successful because they were able to do uh, hanabi uh, and uh, big uh, once a year, the uh, sports day or some gathering and so on. And so uh, uh, my wife's family happened to be uh, one of original members. And those events are taken care of by uh, younger people, like high school people. So they grow with the uh, Harappa. And some of them become so acquainted and marry. And all those people are in Tokyo or Osaka moving around. There's no community, but as that in the summertime, they meet same place together, and it becomes a remarkable community. That is the only case I know. Um, as, as all of you know, I think Mr. Maki has written very eloquently and very beautifully about what he calls the DNA of cities and the uh, sort of the diversity of DNA in great cities around the world. Every city has its own natural characteristics. But these days, I keep wondering, as big skyscrapers, big buildings, roads, tend to become more and more similar. You go to London and you see skyscrapers sure. look very much like those in Tokyo yeah. or New York. What's happening to the DNA? Is it getting thinner? Yes. Um, I think uh, it is an interesting question. The, uh, I wrote the uh, small article on what the Japanese city's DNA. And one of them, besides safety, is uh, gentleness. I think it because uh, the history of Tokyo tells most of them came from agricultural society, where they had certain sort of a, a community spirit. And not all of them now in the big cities, but some of them remained. But also, uh, one of the problems of this Japanese gentleness they are gentle to uh, uh, each other and also to uh, some visitors. But I think it is a production of closed society.
not as open as perhaps in the United States. You just mentioned some uh, try for uh, individuals to uh, make the uh, small community. But only problem such effort is that could it uh, maintain you could we don't know. Even in this Karizawa's case, we don't know what's going to happen in the next 20, 30 years. But it is a very big issue for all people living in cities. No, uh, just having a few friends, enough? Well, there should be uh, some community feeling. One thing about Japan particularly, I think, in terms of DNA and the sort of essence of local uh, community and the diversity of different places, uh, the first pictures I showed this evening were uh, from a film about Shintoism. And to me, it's always seemed that Shinto and the shrines of Shinto, which for the most part are dedicated to a particular deity, a deity that's identified only with this spot, or that rock, or that mountain, and each one is different. That's, in a way, of holding on to oh, the yeah, DNA yeah, of yeah, individual yeah, places. Right. And as long as those shrines exist, and as long as people continue to go back to those shrines, yeah. somehow the DNA is and preserved. And also, the, just as uh, you mentioned, the gentleness arrived from both Buddhism and the Shintoism. Both are very peaceful religion and against the uh, uh, fundamental mm. Mm. and so uh, uh, we owe very much to uh, our religion too. You know, uh, I have uh, some experiences in India designing a building and the area I I designed a museum in uh, Patna, Bihar state. It was the origin of Buddhism because <laughs> the north, Nepal was. So uh, that was oldest the uh, Buddhist institution in Naranda, in the Bihar state. But they are completely destroyed by Islam when they came. So uh, the Buddhists uh, laughed in India, but then Hindu and Islam also do not get along too much. It creates certain political and religious instability. Mm. So uh, mm. yeah. that's my experience. But, but what's interesting in the case of Nalanda now, and I oh. think it speaks to the kind of yearning that modern people have for some authenticity and tradition. In Nalanda now, they're trying to recreate the ancient, ancient Buddhist university exactly. of, of Nalanda. Yes, yes. And uh, Amartya Sen is one of the people oh, really? who's working yes. uh, on, uh, on that yeah, project. Yeah, I see. And yes, I, 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 hope, I hope it succeeds because it's, so a, sure. it's a wonderful yeah. way for the uh, modern world. There was a competition to rebuild this uh, Buddhist uh, institution with the uh, effort of Asian countries. And uh, I participated. I didn't win. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, Mr. Doshi, my friend, won the uh, uh, university and the hope. You see, when I was a uh, student in uh, Tokyo U, the teacher said, do you know which is the oldest institution, in, um, academic institution in the world? We couldn't answer. And he said it's in Bologna. But then we found oh, Nalanda much was older. much older than, uh, but it, it's interesting, mm. your son. Mm. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but before we go into question and answer, I hope there will be a lot of questions. I'd like to show a few pictures of Mr. Maki's, one of his newer buildings at MIT, the MIT Media Lab. 
because I think it speaks very well to his ideas about unconditional love. Um, so this is, this is a night view, obviously, of the building. And to my mind, Boston is a great city. Cambridge is a great city. But it's not very distinguished for architecture. There are very few really great buildings in Boston area. Everything is red brick, right? Almost. This, to me, is one of the most successful, finest buildings in, in Boston. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, and when I think about Japan and Japanese artists, particularly contemporary Japanese artists, great artists like Mr. Maki, I'm always wondering what distinguishes him from other architects around. What is Japanese about this building? Is there anything Japanese about this building because he's a Japanese architect? And it's an interesting question. In this case, there are some very literal references, like the, the screening here is somewhat similar to Sudare in, in old Japanese uh, buildings. But I'm not talking about superficial similarities like that. What else is it about a building like this that I think only Maki-san could do. Let's look a little bit more at the building. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, it's actually, in the previous slides, it looks like there's plenty of room around it, but actually there isn't. It's a, quite a narrow uh, street surrounding uh, this building. So it's hard to get a view of the whole building wherever you stand on the street. Uh, next, next slide, please. But once you go in, what Maki-san has done with light in this building is, to me, is just absolutely amazing. The building is flooded with light. And most of the buildings at Harvard and MIT have small windows, and they're actually quite dark. Um, and darkness may be good for studying. But this, this, I mean, this building is totally flooded with light. I took these pictures just two weeks or so ago before I came to Japan. And I spent an afternoon there, and I spoke to a number of students as they were coming in and out, um, just asking informally what they, what they thought. And they love this building. They love using it. So there's the unconditional love of the architect for his, for his clients and his users. But I think they love it because, for well, many, many reasons. But one of the reasons must be because it has so much light. It feels so healthy. And so uh, this is very unusual in Cambridge. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, so even in the separate labs, this building is full of separate lo laboratories, which are actually quite uh, separated from one another. And what they're doing inside each lab is supposed to be a secret, and they're not supposed to communicate so much. But in actual fact, since it's all glass, it's such a transparent building. And while you can't go into many of the labs, you can see see in because of all of this extraordinary glass and, and windows. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Maki-san also plays a lot of games with light and shadows. And uh, the slide on the left is at the MIT building. But these two on the right, pictures on the right, are from his uh, crematorium, actually, Kazenoka, right, in, in Oita Prefecture, which to me, if one has to end one's life in a crematorium, I can't think of a more beautiful <laughs> place uh, to end. It's really, really extraordinary uh, building. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, and in these vast spaces in the media lab, you actually feel like it's quite intimate because from almost every floor, you can look down into other uh, floors into other labs. Um, it's pure expression of transparency, I think. Please. I try to make the uh, stairways not steep, but gentle. Able to use the, uh, the, uh, this, uh, instead of elevators, which is good you know, for their health. Um, so as one goes up floor to floor within the building on these extraordinary staircases, 
you're aware of the entire building. You're not just in one little corner. You're feeling the whole building around you. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, and then you finally emerge on the top floor into this just overwhelmingly kind of positive, open space. There's a, a really magnificent terrace on the top floor uh, that one comes out onto. Uh, next slide, please. And from here, I mean, I don't need to describe it. You have the most incredible view of Boston from this really, really remarkable open terrace. So you come up through this transparent <laughs> building and emerge into a kind of um, paradise, I guess. So Maki-san, to me, this is the perfect illustration of what you mean by unconditional love, <laughs> the love that you are expressing for your yes, clients yeah. and your, yeah. your students. Uh, I, I, you know, when I designed uh, Media Lab, my client was Nicolas Negroponti, quite a well-known scholar. And he said, please make a big house. And uh, so we tried to make the places visible from one place to others to make them very transparent. You know, MIT, uh, they have uh, uh, many military contracts, so they cannot show the uh, inside of research. But this place is uh, very free. You know, even tourist buses come, and they are able to look into the uh, movement inside. But also, once you are a member of this media lab, you are able to visit the, any place you want. And there's a tremendous sort of a, a family-oriented feeling naturally created. And on Friday afternoon, they uh, have a big lunch with the old members. And evening, the uh, disco parties. <laughs> Etc. But also, you mentioned showed the uh, this uh, crematorium I designed in Japan, and after I visited the uh, place, it's called in Nakatsu in Kyushu Island. Many people said, "Mr. Maki, now we can die in peace." This is the biggest compliment I ever received in my life. It's like uh, running the uh, restaurant, the people come for the last supper. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this Well, Boston. with the Media Lab building, you have given Boston and Cambridge a really great gift. Thank We're you. very yeah. grateful for, yes, for this. Yes. Extraordinary. Yeah. But coming back to uh, waterfront of uh, Boston. I, when I was in the Cambridge, 60s, I went to uh, Pier 4 mm. to have a good piece of martini. It's gone, huh? no. it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. Wonderful restaurant, but it's gone. Oh, you know. Yeah, of course. Sure. Yeah. I'm almost as old as you are, so <laughs> 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 I remember these things. Now it's oh. being replaced by uh, expensive condominium, mm -hmm. I understand. That's right. So uh, That's right. the problem we have uh, also <laughs> invasion of new liberalism. Greece and just uh, mentioned, now the center of the city is becoming very similar. New York, Tokyo, London, and other places. So we just have to uh, try unconditional love for us. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I loved the way you described uh, cultural activity as unconditional love. Um, but for each of you, is there an aspect of Japanese culture 
and an aspect of American culture that you unconditionally love? And what is it? <laughs> Great question. Can, can I? No, Maki Sensei, you said that um, yeah. cultural activity is unconditional sure. love. Yeah. So, Nihonbutsu ka niokete, in Japanese culture, what is the most, the aspect of Japanese culture that you lo unconditionally love the most? And what is the aspect of the American culture that you unconditionally love the most? No. I if you can. <laughs> it's a, uh, not easy question to answer, uh, but uh, as I mentioned to you, often we are asked by client to have his conditional love, and then I said we try to mitigate conditional love to make the, uh, our answer to be more unconditional. And I think when we do buildings in Japan, uh, the difficulty is that all depends on client, <laughs> regardless his nationality. I had a wonderful client in uh, Germany and they accept what we wanted to say. But also, we had a very bad clients in Germany as well. So uh, it all depends on who the uh, clients are. And I, in the uh, filmmaking, you don't have a client, right? Not, not you not have not, clients, uh, not, you not are like very lucky. Mm. Uh, so uh, first, we have to learn who the client is. And uh, when we did a first presentation of our new WTC in New York, there was a small symposium attended by uh, Mr. Silverstein, a client, myself, uh, Richard Rogers, and uh, Norman. Uh, and when uh, I think The symposium was run by uh, one well-known TV person. And when uh, my turn came, he asked me, how could you get along with Mr. Silverstein? <laughs> so I said, well, I didn't know him too much. So I have to learn and study and how to deal with it. And uh, that was the end of my answer. But after the, uh, my answer, Mr. Silverstein came. I learned something from you. So perhaps we have to learn the person first. And it's very important to do, to get, getting along with the person. Yeah, I don't know. I have answer to uh, the uh, your question correct. But, um, I think you spoke uh, about. It, Go ahead, Peter. If uh, if I could try to answer your question, yeah, it's a sure. very deep, complicated one. But I think I mean I I'm American. I grew up in Japan. I don't know whether I'm Japanese or American, but. Um, I love both countries and both cultures, and they are so totally different in so many ways. Even though they may look the same, they're very different. Um, I think in America, what I really love and admire 
is the kind of energy in America and the willingness to take great leaps of innovation and the sort of um, fearless innovative courage that you find in many artists and many uh, uh, American inventors, whatever. And in Japan, maybe I love exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. Japan is a very cautious country. It's very difficult to be innovative. It's very difficult to break rules. Mm -hmm. But for an artist, you have to break rules. You have to jump beyond. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's very difficult for Japanese artists to do that in a totally authentic, honest way. You can do it in a very self-conscious way. But here, the greatest artists that I've known, like Takemitsu, mm -hmm. for example, who's absolutely a global, great intellectual, and great artist, managed to break rules mm -hmm. and to create and be completely innovative, but in a very polite, way. Mm -hmm. As Maki-san was saying, he was very sensitive to his clients, his audience, um, but he was, in many ways, he was insulting them, mm -hmm. but doing it in a way that they didn't realize so much that he was breaking many rules. So that's a very, mm -hmm. uh, it's a very difficult path to walk in Japan, right. but a really, really great Jap Japanese artist is able to be innovative, mm -hmm. I think, but mm -hmm. But we do, quiet way. <laughs> yes, that's, that's, that's my point. The, the, the Japanese artists yeah. who make a big noise, yeah. um, I'm not so impressed with <laughs> you, usually. Mm. Mm. Uh, Takemitsu Toru was an ACC grantee. I know, and, that's why I keep uh, mentioning you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And, and I think to your point, um, I just, I, I love his story. And one of the things that I, love from his story the most is that he developed this appreciation for Western music. And then when he went to the United States on his ACC grant, um, he encountered other American musicians that had developed an appreciation for Japanese music. And it was meeting them and hearing their compositions and hearing how their compositions had been influenced by Japanese composers. He then, in turn, really developed a deep appreciation for Japanese comp composition and traditional music. And I think that that's such a beautiful interchange when you start to appreciate your own culture because you've been exposed to an, a different one. Well, Toru was sort of a one-man Asian cultural council. <laughs> um, uh, to me, he, he was the greatest, single greatest cultural ambassador mm. for Japan because, for example, all the great artists of the world, when they came to Japan, somehow they fell into the hands of, mm. of Takemitsu. They were mm. uh, introduced one, one way or another. And uh, he changed their lives. He introduced a kind of Japan that was so meaningful to him that um, the sort of official handlers or the mm. official introducers wouldn't have introduced him to. I think John Cage mm -hmm. uh, came to Japan, didn't know Takemitsu before he came. He left Japan feeling as though he, Takemitsu was his brother. And what John Cage took back from Japan is not so easily visible but or audible, right. but Japan changed his life, and that was thanks to Takemitsu. And, and I could quote many other people who felt the same way about him. Right. So uh, he's up there in heaven, I hope, you know, recognizing his role as a cultural ambassador right. for this, this Smiling country. Smiling down on us right yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Maki-sensei, I loved actually how you answered my question, which I think, uh, if I can just draw on some things that you said, um, you actually answered the question in a way where you, I think, were, were referring to sort of universal values and um, what is it that you love about American culture and Japanese culture. And in a way, I, I felt I heard an answer there where there's actually an aspect where... Um, in cultural activity, we care about people. We have to care about humanity. And um, and I think that's very much something that was shared by John D. Rockefeller III, uh, the founder of the Asian Cultural Council, and the purpose of why he founded the Asian Cultural Council. So I think um, that's an excellent note to end on. Um, the idea of unconditional love, the idea of cultural exchange, the importance of it. Um, and in closing, I would like to invite our chairman 
uh, of the Asian Cultural Council, Wendy O'Neill, to say a few remarks um, as we thank our incredible, extraordinary speakers tonight. It's just been so wonderful to listen to these great artists and thinkers who've worked across culture and you see the power of the individual to transform worlds. So I really want to thank both of them and I really didn't think we'd be talking about unconditional love. We're talking about cultural exchange, but it's really, really made me think about it in a, in a new way and really touched my heart. So I really want to thank both of you. I want to thank the Sadows who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight and also uh, the support of International House. So thank you so much and for our wonderful audience for being here with us tonight.